Chemistry labs usually come with a couple standard things. You've got a chemist in a lab coat mixing some chemicals, maybe some equipment they use to analyze their products, but a new kind of technology could redefine what constitutes a chemistry lab. It's got chemists and computer scientists really excited. Have a look at this hog. That's one of the cutting edge cryogenically cooled quantum computing devices at IBM, which are available for businesses and researchers to use for a price. What exactly quantum computers will bring to the table, or lab bench, isn't totally concrete yet. But chemists and computer scientists are teaming up now to explore how these machines could make theoretical chemistry more accurate in simulating molecules and how they act and react. Last September, IBM researchers made waves when they found the ground state energy of beryllium hydride, making it the most complex molecule ever modeled using quantum computers. IBM's computer used six superconducting quantum bits to represent the electrons in beryllium hydride, with its whopping three atoms. If that doesn't sound like a lot of qubits, it isn't. The impressive part of this is the shift in how computation itself works. Let's back up. Researchers build quantum computers using qubits. Qubits are quantum systems, as are electrons in a molecule. When electrons whiz around a molecule, it's not quite right to say that they're in a specific energy state, or that they have a specific spin up or down. Instead, they act like they're in each possible state, as long as you don't look at them explicitly. Although classical computers can approximate this weirdness through simulations, qubits are living it. So the thinking is qubits can better simulate other quantum systems, like those electrons flying around a molecule. If I take a benzene ring, for instance, not a lot of, not a lot of atoms in benzene, but there, there are a whole lot of electrons. And uh, even finding the ground state of that simple molecule, um, we use all kinds of approximations. It turns out you can, you can represent in an abstract way each electron in benzene by a qubit. That's Chris Monroe, a physicist and bona fide quantum computer scientist at the University of Maryland College Park. His lab traps individual ytterbium ions to make qubits for its quantum computers. This one's got seven qubits trapped in there, but the team has run quantum simulations on up to 53 qubits. That's still not a lot of qubits if you're thinking about the number of electrons in, let's say, proteins or this metal cluster in an important enzyme, which I'll get to in a sec. You can count the number of electrons and it's many hundreds. And so that means just to represent this system, you probably require a thousand qubits. Um, now, if you want to calculate its ground state, you might need to do error correction as well. But to do error correction, you need to redundantly encode things, and you might need another factor of 10 qubits. So we're already at like 10,000 qubits. But researchers think they're getting there, and even solving the relatively simple problem of beryllium hydride is encouraging. It makes sense to get up to speed with six qubits. Getting, getting used to how, how to how to tweak up that system will help us when we get to 60 qubits and 600 qubits. To, uh, to protein folding in a re you know, really complex problem. And it's that promise of quantum computing to do stuff we can't do now that helps explain why Monroe's already co-founded the quantum computing company IonQ. It's why heavy hitters like IBM, Microsoft, and Google are buying into the quantum revolution. And it's why quantum computing scientist Michelle Simmons of the University of New South Wales was named 2018's Australian of the Year. While some researchers develop quantum computing hardware, others, like computational chemist Alana Spuruguzic, work on quantum computing software, which will help deliver the exact calculations that are beyond the approximations that classical computers provide. So I gave them a choice, a chemist of the future, of an exact algorithm versus an approximate algorithm. I don't know why they would pick an approximate algorithm, only if they are masochists. A Spuruguzic's lab partly developed the method that IBM used to run the record-breaking beryllium hydride calculation. It's an algorithm called a variational quantum eigensolver. And I definitely know what that means, but basically it's a pathway to an exact answer for a molecule's energy level. If quantum computers could deliver exact answers about molecules quickly, it could help identify which molecules are best suited for certain jobs. For instance, Aspuru Guzik's lab has launched a long-term quantum computational expedition for molecules and materials that would be good for photovoltaics. But it's important to ask, where are we going to see quantum computers solving their first useful problems? Molecules that look like drugs or little active sites of proteins or um, small cat catalytic sites and so on are going to be the first applications. Uh, you know, where 
you know, you really want to solve it exactly because perhaps there's a lot of strong correlation, there's a lot of transition metals around, but you don't have the the confidence that a classical method that is approximate will capture all the physics with a lot of without a lot of calibration. One of the active sites he's talking about is buried inside nitrogenase. That's the enzyme catalyst in bacteria that breaks nitrogen apart into ammonia, a chemical that's used across the entire world as fertilizer for growing food. Bacteria use nitrogenase to make ammonia at room temperature. Compare that to how we make our ammonia now. It's the 100-year-old, 400 degrees Celsius process thought up by Fritz Haber and Carl Bosch. It sucks up so much energy to produce the heat and pressure needed that people estimate that this reaction alone consumes 2% of all the world's energy. So, if quantum computing gets us even a little closer to understanding nitrogenase and coming up with similar catalysts, we could be talking a huge payoff. One of the reasons that nitrogenase is driving chemists crazy is because under all its protein chains, it has this pesky little metal cluster called FEMO cofactor. It took 10 years after scientists knew the shape of this thing just to figure out that there was an atom in the middle of it, and then another 10 to figure out it was a carbon. So needless to say, progress has been slow. We don't know as much as we'd like to. What Aspuru Guzik envisions is quantum computers that make researchers better at doing research. He thinks quantum computers will be good for not just simulating known molecules and telling us their properties, but also working alongside artificial intelligence systems that could start with desired properties and help chemists dream up new molecules that possess those qualities. This kind of reverse engineering is definitely a goal down the road, and even though these are mostly theories for now, Aspuru Guzik isn't the only person who's excited about it. John Kelly is the director of analytics at quantum computing software company QBranch which focuses on quantum computing in things like finance and security. But he's still aware of the impact it could have on chemistry. The, the first application where I really saw this, my, my previous position at, at Lockheed Martin, uh, we were doing some work with personalized medicine. And what personalized medicine typically means now is, okay, I have your genotypic and phenotypic information, and I have the drug information, I'm going to predict how you would react to the drug. But instead, I want to be able to say, okay, I have your genotypic and phenotypic information. I want you to have a positive reaction. Tell me what the drug looks like. And that's, th th there's, there's no good way of doing that right now. It's hard to say if or when quantum computers will have these capabilities. For one, we just can't be sure about how fast quantum computing hardware will advance. But we can be sure researchers aren't stopping because the problems are hard to solve. There's still some people that are detractors or like, uh, you know, kind of not as adventurous. Uh, well, let them keep doing kind of their incremental science and let people like me keep doing uh, more forward looking science. And you need scientists from both type of sides. I love them and they should love me too, hopefully. Before we go, we want you to know we've got nothing against classical computers here at Speaking of Chemistry. I mean, you might be watching me on one right now. And there's so much more about quantum computing and chemistry than I could ever, ever hope to fit in this video or even explain. So if you want to read a bit more about how chemistry is making the quantum leap, steer your classical computer to our website to read a terrific story by Katie Borzak. And if you want to stay up to date on that sweet, sweet chemistry news as it happens, please hit subscribe. You know where the button is.